Okay. So I am Benita. On behalf of the entire Organization for Rare Diseases India team, I welcome everyone who has joined today for today's Care for Rare webinar. As one of my team members rightfully said, genetic counseling is that kind of a field that requires expertise in genetics as well as empathy. And likewise, we have today Dr. Deepanjana, who is a level two BGCI certified genetic counselor with over 13 years of experience in human genetics. She's also our West Bengal coordinator for ORDI and an invited member in the Rare Disease Task Force. She is here to talk to us all about genetic counseling, the state in India, and what to expect and so on. So I request Dr. Deepanjana to take over. Um, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Uh, and uh, I uh, would express my gratitude to the ORDI, uh, to the Sinasidol, and everybody in the ORDI. Uh, so, uh, but when we are talking about the uh, human body or a baby, there are three aspects to it. One, the One would be the genetic factor and the other would be the immunological factor. Now, uh, we would not concentrate on the environment or the immunological factor at this moment. Uh, the reasons what can uh, sort of happen is that the child can have certain problems because of the genetic factors and that is exactly where we would be speaking at this moment. So, what we are trying to say over here is that there are uh, three factors that we were talking about, the genes, the environment and the immunological factor. Now, when we are considering the genes, the genes basically have uh, like what it's basically the basic blocks or the basic blueprints of life. And there are 22,000 such genes. And when we are talking about 22,000 such genes, these genes are conceived right upon uh, when a baby is conceived inside the mother. But the expression of these genes can occur at any time. Like it can be at six months, it can be at 10 years, or it can be even at the older age while the child while the person is growing up and uh, the when we talk about diseases here we are basically talking about single gene disorders and here there are about seven thousand such uh, genetic uh, uh, diseases which are known and if we are looking at uh, the possibility of what uh, the affected individual if we are talking about the disease in the perspective of a genetic disorder then uh, the problems in the chromosomes tend to occur more uh, when we are in a prenatal stage, uh, when we are under inside the mother's womb. And uh, these uh, problems start uh, like, as we are more closer to birth, the single gene disorders take more prominence. And while we are growing up, there is multigenic or polygenic reasons. And then there's the environment which brings up the multifactorial reasons. Now, as these are happening, uh, uh, what the WHO uh, and the MOD people have sort of uh, said is that uh, the birth defects accounts for at least 7% of all neonatal mortality and 3.3 million are under five, uh, like under the year uh, of five years. Now, if we are looking at the uh, like infant mortality causes, like 80% of the causes of genetic factors and though that there, there are very detailed uh, reports in the MOD what we also see is that most of these factors are actually single uh, gene disorders which are present now uh, uh, like you know so if we are looking at the Indian perspectives from uh, what we had discussed we have a few uh, data uh, this data in perspective uh, to the Indian is that the causes of the death under five is mostly uh, uh, that there are infectious reasons as well as there are reasons like you will see here that neonatal disorders, congenital birth defects, cardiovascular diseases, kidney diseases, and 80% of these would have a genetic cause. Now, uh, these are reports uh, that have been published in 2013, and it says that 6.64.4 per thousand life births will have a genetic defect. The ICMR has uh, sort of given a definition which says that one in 2,500 individuals uh, will have a disease which is rare. And uh, the 70 million people uh, are at present, this is, this is 
sort of sort of a corollary that we are talking about. It might be that 70 million people are living with a rare genetic disorder, and 70 percent of all the birth defects which are which we are seeing or the problems which we are seeing at birth might be also uh, I would might be preventable in some cases, manageable, and it can significantly affect the quality of life. That is where it becomes alarming because the, the Tao population, this is where the intervention comes in. If we are looking at the newborn genetic data, then it's about 3 to 4 percent has some kind of genetic defect, and 6 percent of all life births will be associated with a genetic defect. 20 percent of the infant deaths will be related to a genetic defect. About 11.1 uh, percent uh, pediatric hospital admissions will again. Uh, have some kind of an underlying genetic disorder. So, so, so obviously, what in the Indian perspective, we can see that's a lot of people we are talking about. Uh, very recently, there has been a publication in 2019 which says why this is uh, something which is of a concern in India. It's majorly because we are an endogamous population. We marry inside communities, and sometimes we marry inside families, which means that there is a prevalent consanguinity, which is also there. Because of endogamy and consanguinity, there is an accumulation of genetic traits between communities. As a result, there is high prevalence of these recessive alleles, which ultimately translate into genetic disorders, causing uh, the, the, the incidence in rare genetic disorders in India alarming. So, uh, just to introduce about the role of a genetic counselor or goals of what we achieve through genetic counseling uh, in very uh, short is that uh, the first thing that comes to mind when you're talking about genetic counseling it is a referral based service. So, obviously, most of the time there is, uh, we don't get people or families who are just walking in for the sake of walking in. So, uh, you know, as a primary consultant, that does not happen. What is happening is that you get reference from super speciality or from uh, uh, the primary care clinician. And if we look at the referrals, then it would be majorly in the prenatal cancer pediatric and in the other motogenic segment, which falls in the adult category. I will not concentrate on the cancer part in this discussion today, but we will be dealing with the other uh, segments which are here. And if we are looking at the process of genetic counseling, it's basically a flow of information which is patient centric and which flows from the primary care provider or the referral doctor to the geneticist to the laboratory. Uh, whatever is uh, achieved through genetic counseling is achieved through this triangle and with the patient's interest in center. And who are these people who are genetic counselors? These are people who are trained in genetics. They can be clinicians who are trained in genetics, or they can be people who are experts in genetics who are trained in the clinical uh, field as well. So, but uh, these people are also, uh, at, like they need to be also uh, pro in psychosocial counseling and also need to understand the social system and the ethical system that comes with. So, in a session, what happens for a genetic counselor? Uh, normally, what happens is that when a family comes in, uh, the the genetic counselor or the geneticist would see through all the previous reports or the what the family has, and also ask specific questions, ask the three generation family history, and accordingly would direct the family towards making some choices. Here, it can be uh, just a, a sort of prevention, a, a screening choices, it can be a diagnosis, or it can be a confirmation of certain suspected genetic disorder. Sometimes it can also be reproductive choices, or it can also be uh, uh, able to calculate the relative risks. So, uh, if we are looking in this perspective, like widening this in a session, what normally happens is first uh, we go through the, the genetic, uh, we go through the available clinical uh, workup that has been done. We explain the role of genetics, and then we cal we explain the various hereditary patterns. We take a three generation family history, and we discuss other options also, uh, which are. Uh, available once the disease is confirmed, we help the family in 
choosing the options of management and also there is a psychosocial support. Now, all this happens with the clinician uh, who is also very much involved in the process and it's, it's again, as I said, a flow of information between the genetic uh, lab, the geneticist, the clinic, clinicians with the interest of the family, uh, which is sort of uh, highlighted at this moment in his own social setup, in his own uh, ethical or religious setup. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, when, when I talk about family history, what we mean over here is that we ask relevant questions that might be related to the suspicion or the uh, or or the disease suspicion or the clinical suspicion that we have so it might be a three gen it will be a three generation family history we will be asking about the more specifically about the first every relatives we will be looking at the ethnic background and we will inquire about the consanguinity on basis of that the the, the inheritance patterns or uh, the, the kinds of inheritance patterns in that particular disease is sort of uh, uh, hypothecated. This is very important. We will come by because later when we are doing a genetic testing or we are trying to do a differential of what can be the genes that are involved or associated, this particular family patterns or inheritance patterns becomes very important. The reason we have to take a three generation is that sometimes if we take a two generation, the autosomal, if you can see in this picture, the autosomal recessive and the X-linked recessive will look absolutely the same. Sometimes the autosomal dominant would have reduced penetrance, so it will skip generations. So, but then there will be other family members who might be affected and we might get a hint out of it. There is also mitochondrial disorders where it will not follow these patterns and that is also one thing that we have. There can also be mosaicism, there can also be de novo mutation. So hence, the inheritance, pat inheritance patterns becomes very important in uh, sort of getting the clinical suspicion uh, uh, and also creating a differential uh, of the disease that might be there. Then there is also a, a sort of dysmorphology scan for the person if that is relevant. If it's, a, uh, if it's a sick patient which we are looking at, there is also a dysmorphology scan where we look at the hair, the eyes, the, the teeth, the feet, the uh, hands, the ears if there are any skin lesions so these are all adding up to my information as a, and and my clinic and helping me for a clinical suspicion of a disease and also helping me towards having a, a, a set of differential now when we are doing a genetic counseling we come across people from varied uh, social structure we come across people with varied religious beliefs and we come across people with varied education so uh, the process of genetic counseling has to be uh, non-judgmental and it cannot be directed. We cannot be saying what to do, what not to do. We are there only to give options and help them take a decision. So we will not be taking a decision on their behalf. Also, there in the whole process, there is a lot of uh, there's a deep cycle that takes place. There's a lot of guilt, anger, frustration, anxiety. Uh, but which which we need to deal with. There is lot of communication and information transfer, and also there the, the there is also a lot of social and supportive services which the genetic which I will be saying uh, in the subsequent slides that which the genetic counselor will start um, you know discussing once we have a particular diagnosis, and ultimately as I am I I say it's also a team effort because the genetic counselor. Uh, along with the primary physician would be referring to different people and all of them will come in to make a better decision a better lifestyle for this family. Now, uh, if you are looking at the types of genetic counseling, there are two kinds of genetic counseling. One is the prospective counseling where, and one is the retrospective counseling. In prospective counseling, we are basically screening. It is predictive. There is a sort of suspicions we are trying to see it and then we are trying to manage it. Among screening, it can be a prenatal screening, it can be a career screening and retrospective can be where there are a set of diagnosis. I'm trying to confirm a diagnosis or I understand that there is a genetic uh, uh, background or 
problem that is there, but I am not sure which one, or I am confirming, I'm sure what it is, but I'm confirming for the sake of uh, trials or for the sake of knowing better. And uh, uh, and and on basis of that, there is the management. So uh, based on this, we uh, uh, the counseling setting is three stuff. And if we are doing a prospective counseling, normally what we are discussing is uh, we are understanding the family history, we are understanding the, the, the situation and trying to give a disease education in which we are talking about, we are trying to assess risk uh, and we are trying to give a reproductive decision as in a prenatal diagnosis or a prenatal screening. At the same time, a psychological assessment becomes very important at this point because uh, the primary care physician or the genetic counselor at this point might believe that the family might also need the help of a psychologist because there is a psychosocial assessment that is also done during the session. Uh, if we are doing a prospective uh, genetic counseling, normally the questions that we face is that am I or is my baby at risk? Can it be detected? Can it be prevented? Can it be avoided? Can it be managed? How severe it, uh, it will be? So these kinds of questions are uh, seeing uh, or are trying to answer when we are doing a prospective genetic counseling. If we are looking at reference, uh, it would be uh, normally advanced maternal age, abnormal maternal serum screening. There is a problem in the USG. There is a, a previous a fetus or a child with genetic disorder. There are family history with genetic disorder. There is a family member with genetic disorder. There is a family history of cancer or there are specific hereditary cancers are present there's maternal disorders uh, which are associated with uh, risk of uh, fetal uh, CMD or exposure to teratogens, consanguinity, bad obstetrical history, there's infertility related chromosomal abnormality, there is embryo, there's a, we are, we are, uh, there is a thing of uh, PGS or embryo selection in case of IVF or even uh, a decision whether an ERP would be done or not. Uh, in a prenatal setting, normally the first line of test would be screening if there is a significant family history that is taken up or if there are any other kind of history that is associated also the ethnicity. If positive, they are normally referred to a gen geneticist and uh, the geneticist does rest of the workup. Sometimes the geneticist might not do a workup because of the simple reason of, uh, you know, the diseases might not be related to genetics or it might not be relevant at that point. And then there can be follow-ups regarding and then the decisions can be taken. Once the child is born, uh, there are screenings available which are called the newborn screening program. And in the newborn screening program, what uh, we look at, if we look at the Indian perspective, like uh, every uh, country has their own kind of guidelines as far as newborn screening is concerned. In India, normally we see a basic seven, uh, which is the basic screening, uh, the thyroid, the CAH, the PKU, the BP, uh, with the hemoglobinopathy and uh, and also the sickle cell anemia and the SCA. This is the basic seven for the India. But then uh, uh, in most of the states, what we are doing is the basic three. It's the D6PD, the congenital the hypothyroidism and the CA. But what you see over here is alarming that you see we have state-specific values which are there. And there has been no such, uh, till date, no such sort of screening program in healthy population to understand the incidence. So even if we are coming up with a newborn screening, we really do not have the exact data on basis of which we will actually have an Indian uh, uh, newborn screening uh, list, which should be looked at in normal population and also in the sick population. So uh, uh, like uh, going on the same uh, way, see that there are what we are doing in newborn screening is we are screening presumably healthy populations and if there is a sick child then a certain expanded newborn screening is also done which also includes uh, which includes the metabolic disorder now uh, this is done to the goal is to prevent or reduce morbidity and mortality the role of a genetic counselor becomes important because there are some ethnic uh, uh, like incidences which make them relevant. So uh, Indian government does have an initiative which is called Rashtriya Bal Swastha Karika, uh, where we are screening for congenital defects, left lip, club growths, developmental disorders, deficiency. Kerala has been leading it. We 
have Goa also, which is coming up. But then the other states, we really don't have any such screening program as per se. Uh, so sometimes uh, these disorders happen in the third month, six month, where the infant is born absolutely fine. But then the metabolic problem starts cropping up, the developmental problem starts coming up, which uh, sometimes leads to a problem in also identifying the disorder. Because once such things come up, it has been seen that an average family sees about seven physicians before the disease is actually located. So this is where genetic counseling or the role of a genetic counselor becomes very important. When we are talking about retrospective concern, the other part where the, there is a disease suspicion and we are seeing a sick child or a sick patient, in that case it is what genetic testing is, and what is the way forward, what would be the lifespan, what if there will be any lifestyle issues, whether there is a medicine therapy trials, are there any social issues, what about the rest of the family, if there are children, are they a carrier, and also the psychological issues associated with this. So the questions which we face here is why did this happen? Did I eat something? Did I do something? Um, other people in my family are normal. Other children in my family are normal. I have other children who are normal. So uh, uh, so these kind of things are there. Is it life threatening? What will my child be able to grow up and uh, you know uh, have a life of their own, or will the child be always under support of somebody? So these supportive care, these are what the best retrospective concern is. Now, if we split up, as I said, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, if we split up what we are normally looking at, is that the primary care uh, provider and the geneticist along with the patient, what are we looking at? The perspective of the consultant. The consultant, the first thing which we have is basically the first thing which I said, the family is to try any, any uh, clinical report. Deep phenotyping, which means that we are actually assessing the child phenotypically. We are looking at the symptoms or dysmorphism or anything that we can pick up. Uh, then comes the second layer, which is the genetic testing. And then comes the laboratory testing. And then comes the post-test counseling. So it's basically a process. It's not a one-time visit. It's normally a two-time visit. One before the test, one after the test. It's not more. Sometimes... Uh, more number of visits are required. Now, just to put things in perspective, I will not discuss any case study in detail, but just to give you a perspective, this day, this couple had about nine, uh, this couple had about as many as six pregnancy losses with one child who was a stillborn. Uh, the, the, there was no significant family history except that she had a sibling who was also stillborn. And when we were screening everything, we found that her she has a condition which is related to thrombophilia, but it's not picked up in the regular thrombophilia workup of protein C, protein S, APLA, uh, not that. What we do, what we found over here was there was a, a gene called HRG gene, and this gene is also related to thrombophilia. However, uh, in this particular person, even a donor egg will not work because this, this, this particular person has this condition where we have to actually use a surrogate with a donor egg and then only, and the husband sperm, and then only this is going to work because HRG gel have problems in implantation itself. So this is, uh, helps, if we can find such things, it helps in uh, the reproductive decision making and helps them for a guided management. They can even consider adoption in such cases. Also, uh, the very important role of a career screening comes in over here. Here is a couple who had children who were born fine, but then had uh, incidents of uh, diarrhea and uh, white stool and, they, and jaundice, uh, and they expired at nine months and 10 months. Uh, they wanted to have a healthy child, but if we are looking at when we screened them because the children were not available when we screened them, we found that they were sort of uh, heterozygous for this particular FBT1 gene, which is a gene which is uh, sort of related to uh, metabolism, uh, in one area of metabolism, and this is very rare. This is not even a consanguineous family, but as I said, this was an endogamous family. It was a marriage which was between within a community. So these uh, things do crop up. Again, 
this is another case where uh, there is no family issue, there's no consanguine issue, but what we saw was that the fetus had bilateral short fever, the, there were short bones that were present. Uh, so, in this case, when uh, we found that the fetus had short uh, span, what the genetic counselor here does is to first rule out whether it's constitutive or not. It can be certain families who are short in nature. So, in this case, the genetic counselor would go back to the parents of the uh, couple and see and find out whether what is the midparental height. Is, is there any such issues which are there, the constitutional uh, short status if it was not there and also here there was another sort of uh, guide over there where the femur link to foot ratio was lesser than 0.8 so that was an indication for skeletal dysplasia and in such cases again when a genetic workup was done in the fetus itself we found that it was an autosomal dominant likely to be a mutation possible and if it's imperfect if the workup was not done if the genetic counseling not done if the clinician did not have the suspicion then none of this would be possible so again it helped them to make informed decisions in this pregnancy and also guided them for the next pregnancy again uh, this is a setup uh, with a uh, uh, neuro uh, pediatrician where uh, you can see that this particular uh, man had seizures and he uh, what the genetic workup was also done and he had a mutation in a very common case but uh, he was concerned that whether his children would, child would have it or not and we could predict it because uh, we calculated the penetrance over here and then we gave that the child uh, has this amount of chance this, this percentage of recurrence rate of uh, the same thing happening but we also what we found out was that there are other family members who have similar presentations in the family and uh, though the brother does not have, his own brother does not have the symptom, but the brother's uh, son has a similar kind of symptom. Though we did not screen him, but still we can predict that there is a chance that about 4% chance that the, this particular child would also be carrying the same mutation. So when we screened, we got a different mutation. It was a, a Form T1 mutation, it was a different mutation. But then at the same time, you see here the suspicion that this can be a genetic disorder is very strongly raised. And hence the family who actually did not come to uh, me for counseling also considered counseling and came. So, uh, so there are other members of the family where we also make this up. So this is, uh, again, sometimes as I said, there is a, the, the, the disease can be similar. Uh, it can be of different kinds, but the reason to visit the the primary uh, clinician can be different. You can see that in the first case, the child uh, visits for hepatomegaly and anemia. The second one, the child visits for neuronal regression. And the third, the child visits for um, neurological regression as well as hepatomegaly. And all these children have Gaucher disease, but the type is different. And all of, uh, like the first and the third, there are interventions that are present, which, and these are available through charitable access programs, which a genetic counselor along with the clinician can help uh, choose for the family or help the family get enrolled. Uh, this is a case where there are two brothers over here. Uh, the first brother has a condition called uh, GSD3. Uh, there was no genetic counseling or no diagnosis there done, but the second child got affected. Uh, so, uh, so the second child got affected. In such a case, uh, this was a consanguineous family. So intervention was required, which was not done. So this second child's condition could have been prevented, or it can also be that right now when we diagnosed the first child, what we started was management so that the second child does not get uh, as severe symptoms or the quality of life is a bit better and the symptoms starts, uh, you know, we can stall the appearance of the symptoms in these cases. Also, sometimes it reduces the diagnostic ODC. See, for example, a person is coming with uh, polymicrovia or lysencephaly, and here, or coming with epilepsy. So you would uh, first go for an MRI, maybe metabolic testing, and then genetic testing. But if we go for a genetic testing, or like, you know, first we have a family history, we check everything, and we go for a genetic testing. In certain cases, sometimes it reduces the diagnostic ODC of so many testings as a result. It ultimately maybe genetic testing is costly, but in this scenario, it sometimes saves the money as well. 
So uh, the next uh, thing which I would uh, discuss over here is the genetesis. Uh, the next thing that I would discuss over here is the genetesis with the laboratory. What what role that do we play when we give a test to a laboratory? So number one, the first is to decide which test to do. So after the evaluation of the medical and the family history, what we do and the physical history, what we do is we first understand what disease, what what differentials are we looking at. If we are looking at a chromosomal uh, uh, condition, or we are looking at a methylation problem, like in Prader-Willi syndrome, or we are looking at a genetic problem where the gene is very well known, like thalassemia, which is very targeted or we are looking at something like cystic fibrosis, or we are looking at a panel of disorders, like maybe a Jobit syndrome, where we know there are certain disorders or a, a muscular dystrophy, a particular kind of muscular dystrophy. So basis of this, uh, the clinical evaluation, we decide what platform we are testing. So uh, once that is done, uh, so it's, it's very, uh, it, it's, it's uh, good to separate between a chromosome and a genetic test, but even when we are looking at genes, we have a lot of options. There can be uh, targeted genes, there can be small gene panels, or there can be genome-wide uh, panels, genome-wide uh, exploratory panels, which we are talking about. So again, here my differentials which I'm providing will guide me through the genetic testing as in what do I want? Do I want a focus panel? I want a broader panel? I want a germs or I want genomes? Uh, when we are looking at uh, genetic testing, even to NPS, if you just write uh, exome sequencing or if you just write uh, whole exome sequencing as a clinician, the problem is uh, with the lab, what the problem the lab gets is that it's like a library and you say, find, uh, you know, you say, read it all and find where uh, there was a typo. That is not possible. That is not physically or, you know, it's not possible to anything. So the reason is to narrow down what you are looking for, to, you know, be more specific. As in, you say, it's in that particular rack, it's in that particular page, it's in that particular paragraph there is a problem and that problem needs to be detected. So if you narrow down your choices or if you narrow down your uh, differentials, it's easier for the lab to give you a more informative report. Now, now, what is happening at this point is that when you are, uh, when, when does the lab look at everything which you are getting, if, even if you are giving a whole exam sequencing or a whole exam sequencing, no. What you are getting over here is basically what you see over here in the line, which is we are getting the common alleles, we are getting the low frequency variants, we do get rare variants as well. The common variants are obviously not, some which are influencing the disease will be reported, but there will be a lot of common variants which will not influence the disease, those will be excluded. But there is a small possibility that the rare variants which are small effects or the, uh, you know, these particular variants which are very, very rare, might be dropped out or might not amplify and hence we might not, uh, you know, the lab might not be able to report them. So if we are looking at the mutational profile, you will see uh, if we are talking about genes, then there can be one, the point mutations, or uh, there can also be bigger deletions and duplications. In a single gene, like say cystic fibrosis or even a DMD. Uh, so, uh, if there's a cystic fibrosis or even a DMD, what we know is that these particular genes will have some point mutations, some deletions and duplications. So this knowledge is very important because that will guide us whether additional testing is required. Nowadays, even the, uh, the particular uh, exome sequencing can pick up these particular indents. So it becomes very important for the geneticists to sort of guide the lab that, see, I'm also looking at these particular deletions and duplications, please check them. So as I said, the NG sequencing right now is able to give us heterozygous index. And also uh, the one thing which becomes very important in such reports is also whether this particular genes are present when you're getting a homozygous variant, like compound heterozygous variant, whether they are on the same chromosome or whether they are on two uh, different chromosomes. For that, we would need uh, the Sanger sequencing and uh, in such cases, the role of the genetic counselor in interpreting the inheritance and interpreting whether this is in cis or trans becomes very important. Now, as I said, like if you are writing a uh, sort of next generation sequencing, it seems 
this should be a solution for most of the disorders. But the problem is for the lab, you know, uh, they are using filtering techniques. So if you don't guide them, if you are not filling up the TRF or if you are not filling up the information properly, the output you are getting through the report is also not good. So basically, here we are talking about structured phenotyping. Say, for example, a child comes to you and you just write it as developmental delay. So that is one thing which you can write. You can more emphasize on developmental delay, seeing seizures, hearing loss, and you might be very happy that I gave very, uh, you know, I, I gave a lot of information over there. But then that is also not good enough. What you need to write is uh, there is a moderate developmental delay and what signs, like if it's a broad spine, speech, is there an uh, intractable seizure, like the onset, like, you know, when you're talking about seizure, the onset, uh, what kind of seizures you are looking at, are there dysmorphic seizures, what kind of hearing loss are you looking at. If you're filling these up, all these have what we know as, you know, they, they have a common kind of phenotyping or terms, which is known as the HPO terms. These HPO terms, when fed into the filtering, then uh, it makes more sense when we are doing uh, uh, genetic analysis. So basically, this is the whole of genome. This is the whole of exome. And when you are looking at just the intellectual developmental delay, which is this uh, middle surface, with the epilepsy panel, there is an over, overlap. And with hearing loss panel, there is an overlap. Bring in the uh, family data in it, you are filtering your data more. And uh, in this structure, basically what is happening is that the geneticist is uh, sort of, you know, unifying these two, the clinical information, as well as this information, and creating these HPO terms, giving it to the labs, and helping in uh, creating the particular filter that the lab needs to know for analysis or variant annotation. So basically what is happening is that when the, uh, your patients or uh, your own genetic sequence is being uh, uh, analyzed, there is a uh, set of uh, filtering that goes on in the lab, which is basically a quality check for you. Once that quality check is done, there is a basis of, uh, you know, uh, putting out the benign uh, variants which are there. And then there are these case-specific filters. My point is that the genetic counselor is providing these case-specific filters. And sometimes the clinicians are also providing these case-specific filters. If these case-specific filters are not there, then the quality of your data drops significantly. As a result, you know, if you are looking at what we saw as the option one, then you just get this particular report. It might be good enough for you, but then maybe the report two or report three, more information, you get more, and maybe it will be more beneficial to your patient. So this is where it be a pre-test counseling becomes very important. Now, post-test, you might get a positive report or a negative report where we we know all, we all are right now very aware of these terms like pathogenic, like lipatogenic. We are all aware of variant of unknown significance and obviously if it's a benign one, we don't need to look at it. But uh, number one, the likely pathogenic and the BOUS are certain things which need sometimes further testing, further clinical correlations. And this clinical correlation uh, becomes very important and this, sometimes, this is all the time happens with the clinician Concern. There are specific APMG provided guidelines about how to report, and that most of the labs are following this particular guideline. So, the post test counseling again, uh, now you can see there are three people, and in the post test counseling, three people really become very active the referring uh, doctor, the geneticist, and the laboratory. The laboratory provides the data to the geneticist, the geneticist imparts the information to the family as well as the primary care provider. But sometimes cases like this can also happen. This is a five-year-old child with a bilateral pneumonitis and uh, was suspected of a spastic uh, disorder, a non-consanguineous family. There was uh, no uh, significant history, but there was presence of polyhydramnion. And what we found was Gautier type 2. Uh, it seemed that it matched Gautier disease type 2, but what we got was this was an autosomal recessive disease. So but we still got it as heterozygous. We went ahead and checked the enzyme in this case because the child was somehow because got a disease type of a neuronal type uh, disorder. So we, uh, on that clinical suspicion, not just waiting on the genetic report, 
the doctor decided uh, to go ahead with the enzyme assay and it turned out to be positive so again understand that your clinical suspicion is again very important in this case what we are looking at the phenotype is important in this case why not catch it the reasons can be many the first reason being this can be a deep in chronic lesion this can be in the intron and you have done an intron and hence you have missed it uh the once you are testing the actionability of the test becomes very important so here there are rigorous clinical uh, validity and use as as you can kind of uh, iems there are certain kind of disorders uh, like uh, other disorders also where uh, even epilepsy seizures where the decision of taking a medicine there are certain other kind of disorders like uh, autism where creatinine deficiency you can supplement that so this, there, there are rigorous clinical uh, utility over there sometimes this utility is in form of reproductive decisions and life planning sometimes it is in form of also the management and the planning of the health so uh the patient has a decision some the patient is uh the the particular would talk talk about the and they uh they talk about uh can somebody please mute the mic uh yeah they would talk about uh the genetic counselor would be referring to the metabolic nutrition and uh, there uh, again there would be a lot of discussions the need should be uh, mentioned to the family and uh, these kind of reference have to be made so that you know the family understands why to visit and definitely this is there also some uh, we sometimes have to uh, discuss the milestones which the doctor would probably like us to the patient remains informed and does not worry that you know the Altered by so I have given the example of a family. So we hand over the the, the family that this is your altered milestones. Go and consider the milestones which are out there for the other children. Even this is uh, viable for a Noonan syndrome child. So uh, these particular information need to be discussed post test. Uh, uh, there are some some disorders where there are checklists like this available. Checklists are done by a medical. and these checklists can be sort of given to the patient as a result and of age wise as a guide for the patient chart as to what the follow up so all of these have to be uh, sort of discussed post test also sometimes it might come in form of early intervention programs or intervention programs like uh, physiotherapy occupational therapy speech therapy special education all this and the ex, the the goals of these need to be discussed over here and referred to the subsequent people uh epilepsy if you see the uh, incidence is uh, basically pretty high at 2.5 to 11.9 there are certain kind of uh, mutations which you see and these kind of mutations also have an implication in the drug uh, uh drug of choice or the dose of drug of choice so in these cases we can get back to the clinician uh, with these kind of information with papers that can be uh, there and we can discuss them with the clinicians and if the clinician makes the final decision if he feels that it is okay then he might sort of intervene over here and change the dose or change the medication and see what suits the family and in this case the family will be benefit also sometimes uh, in some cases we need to discuss the national uh, rare disease uh, policy which uh, is sort of in an interim phase but it is still there uh, in the states there, there are some some states which are coming up with uh, rare disease task forces where uh, we can actually talk about uh, bone marrow transplants you know where these uh, patients can get some relief and if the patient is very poor they can actually think about all this once the government starts to know that there are patients of these kind the policy will also amend and there will be greater good for greater people uh, there are lot of uh, trials or management therapies that are available bone marrow transplant as i said in case of immunodeficiency there are enzyme replacement assays there are chaperone therapies there are antigen therapies so all 
all of them are very costly, but understand this also that there are charitable access routes which are available. There are expanded access programs. So these need to be discussed and these need to be highlighted as well. Uh, because, uh, uh, like, see this particular child at three years, uh, at the child was absolutely normal at birth, but at three years later, the child started having challenges. And this is our, this is a child from our very own India. And you see that, uh, this, you see on your right, there is, you see that, that there's a, uh, a skeletal dysmorphism, which is present with the syndrome known as Hunter syndrome. And in this case, what you see that uh, when the child was diagnosed, the child was actually put in uh, Jati therapy in Gangaram Hospital. And the child at present is doing quite well. The child is 20 years and all these dysmorphisms, some of them have gone down. Obviously, it does not go cross blood, blood brain data, so the damage of the data is already done. But if we do an early intervention and if we are more proactive, probably we can save uh, or improve the quality of life more. So basically, when we are looking at therapies, uh, early diagnosis plays a very important role. And once you detect it, also the number of trials have certain inclusion criteria. So you need to discuss the management so that they stay in those inclusion criteria. And you talk about the side effects and off target effects of the drugs as well. Uh, so this is a trial, uh, uh, like this is uh, another very common disorder, which is known as a DMDN. Here, the parent, uh, Dilip Singh, has spoken about how it took so much time for a uh, diagnosis to happen. And uh, though we do have trials which are going on, uh, on this, there is a stop food on trial which is uh, being run in India and they are probably still recruiting. And there are other uh, trials which are there for Exxon 51 and Exxon 45. So these trials are now recruiting as well. So we need to sort of at least tell the patients that they can uh, they, they, they can at least apply to these trials there. Also, another very important role is the role of the patient support group. If your patient feels that your patient, uh, if your family is alone, and uh, you know, uh, as uh, Sir has very correctly mentioned, it's because of the management um, is if we don't come together, if uh, we don't come together as one. Uh, and don't help the patient and don't you don't refer the patient to such an umbrella organization uh, then the issue is that they might be losing out on many important information they might not be aware of such information or such amendments which are there like you can file PIS in court you can get some kind of relief from some kind of money you can be put into some kind of clinical trials so all these informations or the hope or even the family support the day-to-day -day support or the day uh, necessities of these support becomes very important. There are specific disease groups also, the patient support groups which are there. So if you know any of them, it's also your prime responsibility to put these uh, patients, uh, you know, in association with these patient support groups because in this way you are actually maintaining a registry which is there and you are helping in maintaining a group and helping in maintaining a support which probably no clinician, no geneticist, no laboratory can provide. So this is something which is very important. It's giving the strength to the people of the community. So um, discussing everything, there are also barriers in the plan. Uh, the first barrier which I have faced the multiple times is uh, the fear of uh, you know uh, measuring the risk versus benefits. Uh, say for example, uh, every clinician says that in an amniocentesis there would be a risk of one percent. So this person thinks that in that 1% risk, I will lose my baby. I will not do a prenatal testing. But this is our information uh, in the sense that uh, probably he's not getting the clarity in the mind that if a child is born and subsequent hospitalizations might be more traumatic. So uh, in this case, uh, you cannot direct the patient to do what you want, but at least you can. Uh, weigh the risk versus benefits in front of him, weigh all the options in front of him so that he can make an informed decision. There is fear of social stigma that if, uh, I, if, if, my, if, if my daughter is a carrier, then the, my daughter will not get married. You are saying this, that my son has an excellent disorder, then uh, the other sister will not get married. 
there is also a misconception of the cost. These tests are costly, but then there are ways to get these tests done in uh, different uh, locality. Also, you need to get these kind of information. Obviously, most of the Indian people have the poor economic status, but then there comes a role of uh, support groups. There comes a role of crowd uh, financing. Uh, there is also incomplete counseling where the uh, the whole information is not given. Also, sometimes the need of the test needs to be evaluated. So you, uh, when you are deciding that uh, sort of you know you, your patient needs to do a further testing, the utility of that test, whether that patient really needs to do that test, uh, should be taken into concern. And like you will say that of course that this is a genetic test and this is uh, awesome for you to do. But then at the same time, you should also say that whether the patient might not do this test right at the moment, wait for a few days, or uh, might not do it at all. Like say, for example, you are seeing a PKU positive in the NDF, and the uh, family does not plan to you know, uh, have any further kids. So you can definitely say that we can start, uh, you know, the doctor, you can start treatment on that uh, regard. But uh, the genetic testing can definitely. Wait. So uh, involve the patient in the decision. Sometimes, uh, say for example, we see in recurrent uh, pregnancy loss patients that uh, they are uh, so traumatized that you know if you tell them to do more testing, uh, it's better for them to adapt or it's better for them to go for an IVF with a donor gamut rather than you know be involved in the OTP of testing. For them, having the baby is important, not how they have the baby. So here, the decision of the patient should be uh, sort of uh, kept in mind, and the, the the patient should have the autonomy to choose what they want, that, rather than what you feel is correct for them. They might be choosing the wrong thing. Also, you might be uh, uh, you know trying to convince them regarding certain things like this is the benefit, this is the uh, this is the you know risk which you are taking. But then it is ultimately the patient's decision in moving. Uh, while counseling, we do have some unique features which are present in India or uh, because we have specific religious beliefs which prevent uh, the community to do certain things. There are specific cultural uh, issues, there are consanguineous marriage, there are also issues regarding abortions. There are communities which uh, do not want to go in for abortions, there are communities which do not want to go in for gamut donation. So when it's not like you will not say these, but uh, when you say this, you have to be sensitive to the person's uh, social and religious beliefs as well. Uh, uh, that person might be a, uh, might be very much uh, involved in these social and religious beliefs, and there is no way we can hurt them. Them, but at the same time, the the, the risk versus benefit should also be laid down in front of them. It should be a dialogue rather than a monologue. So. Uh, this, I felt, is a perfect forum to discuss this about the ethical issues and the policies. Now, uh, as I mentioned that here, uh, when we are doing the genetic testing or when we are doing the genetic counseling, it's never really just the uh, patients, the clinicians, and the, lab, uh, and, and the lab. There are other people or the other social people involved. Here, the lab genetic counselor, whom you are not even seeing, becomes very important. Why? Because the lab genetic counselor or the laboratory directors or the staff, they, their ethical committee are taking few decisions on your behalf. And what are these decisions? These decisions are uh, much from basically the guidelines that followed are ACMG guidelines, which are American. There is no Indian guideline that is present. We do have a PCT and DT guideline which is there, but it does not tell us that, uh, you know, under our social or religious setup, what should be. Uh, in our country, where female suicide is so high, disclosing a failure screening status for an X-linked disorder comes with a lot of patriarchal trauma. And as a, but not disclosing also is a very bad thing to do because this uh, this particular person might go ahead thinking that she has no risk in the next generation and uh, might not get into genetic counseling or might not be asking for any such uh, genetic counseling uh, or going into such genetic testing. So that becomes a threat. So the companies normally take a call on this behalf uh, and they take it under the guidelines of the ACMG and the PCT 
negative but still, still there is a lot of ambiguity that is present at the same time there are technical issues like maternal cell contamination uh, none of the good laboratories would release a report uh, which has uh, an mcq positive they keep the report because they will not release reports but still this is there there nowhere in india there is a guideline which says or bars any diagnostic company for releasing a report so there is no guideline present now uh, we do have a timeline for elective termination at 24 weeks but we don't have a guideline for invasive clinical diagnosis uh, which means that if this is somebody comes at 24 weeks do we actually test that person or what do we do over there uh, there is no database, no management uh, or clinical trial or expanded access, uh, which, which are uh, in an online government server like clinical.gov, which is present in the uh, US, but not here. And these create a lot of problems because you might not be informed, you might not know, the, the, the clinician might not know, the genetic counselor might not know. I uh, created a lot of problems. Uh, which uh, sort of can uh, affect the whole uh, scenario. At the same time, the reporting of the BOUS in the prenatal setup, India has a huge population. None of us report uh, variant of unknown significance. None of us are able to totally clinically correlate. So uh, what happens in such a population if we get BOUS? There are many where these will be causing. So what? how do we actually rule that up and what is our indemnity? In ruling these people out, these, these BOUS out. So uh, then comes the non disclosure to close relatives. So if, if one particular, if you see a familiar disorder, say epilepsy, or say, for example, uh, some other kind of uh, disorder like a do you, and if this family says that I will not say this to my sibling, I will say that my uh, son or daughter is just sick. So is that ethical? Uh, now, how how will that influence the reproductive decision or anyhow the decision of the other members of the family? Also, here in most cases, uh, though the company is uh, all of the diagnostic companies right now promotes genetic counselor. They have uh, genetic counselors who are looking at it, but there's a huge conflict of interest over here uh, because uh, are we teaming up genetic counselors as techno sales people or what are we doing over here? So uh, here there is a conflict of interest present and somewhere uh, this needs to be addressed. So it's a very good thing that probably most of uh, the laboratories are actually going into genetic counseling for uh, giving the correct report and for counseling each of the patients. But then what is very important over here is uh, the consenting and uh, the knowledge whether the family is aware of it, whether whom you are consulting, they are aware of it. Also, if you're testing a pre-symptomatic child or a subclinical uh, level, like maybe the child has subclinical phenotypes, you're uh, sort of testing the child. Uh, what becomes important is whether uh, you know the whole consenting and what you are going to report in this particular, like what the laboratory reports for this particular child. In case of a minor, uh, in India, every decision is taken by the parents or the clinician, but uh, Somewhere uh, there are position statements uh, present for uh, in other countries, but India does not really have a position statement, and this can sometimes cause harm rather than good. So uh, right now, a genetic counselor does not have the power to overrule this autism, but such statement, uh, such a position statement should be there. Here we are talking about autism. Uh, you, you probably. Uh, sort of maybe understood that the child uh, is pre-symptomatic and you tested and there is autism or maybe you tested a particular cancer and you, you get a sort of a BRCA1 mutation in the child, what do you do? Do you report? Do you not report? Do you withhold the report? So, uh, if, uh, so if, if, uh, if I was able to give you a 360 view of what genetic counseling really is, the whole idea for this is basically early intervention. And if we can get more people, if we can detect more people in a pre-symptomatic or pre-reproductive uh, phase, then the number of symptomatic people reduces. Now we are here where we are actually uh, sort of detecting, uh, trying to diagnose patients over here. But then it, it's basically uh, the we need to flip this curve what is there. Uh, summarizing what genetic counseling really is, it's basically 
basically that we look at uh, these aspects of mode and risk of inheritance, age, penetrance, accessibility, age of onset, penetrance, and accessibility of the disease. In the process, we educate and support uh, the family. Um, some reports might have potential implications. Some reports might have potential uh, interventions which need to be discussed with the clinician, and the clinician can take a call on that behalf. And sometimes there can be uh, employment and insurance uh, issues. There can be disability certificates, which, uh, the, like you know, uh, uh, you uh, the, the family might need, and there can be some other familial communication which needs to be done, or there can be uh, there can also be a psychological aspect to this. And there is of course a set of referrals that go on. So uh, we are basically patient advocates over here, and. Uh, at the same time, we are uh, sort of bridging the gap between the laboratory and the clinician because uh, the clinician's time might not permit uh, in taking such uh, detailed uh, history and detailed phenotyping. And that is where uh, we are sort of bridging the gap in spite of uh, doing all of this. So with that, I would uh, end my lecture. And uh, if uh, there are questions, I would like I would. Um, yeah, so that was a very nice lecture. I think you managed to cover every single aspect of genetic counseling. Um, I think there is one question for you. Uh, Raja Varman, he asked whether there were any specific databases for inborn metabolic variants. Uh, there are no specific databases for inborn metabolic variants. Uh, at the same time, there are uh, uh, in, in US, there are of course inborn metabolic groups, and uh, there is also an LSCSS group which is present, which is very active. So these groups are present, but uh, in India also, but there is no asset database as far as my knowledge. Okay. Okay. And I think there is just one more question. So, Gush had asked. What were the chances of a person inheriting an autosomal recessive disorder? Uh, again, depending whether the person has consanguinity or not, uh, if the person does not have consanguinity, uh, then uh, the thing would be uh, uh, a 25% risk for the next generation to have an infected child. But if there is consanguinity, then the uh, degree of relatedness will uh, count it, and then the risk would change. Okay. And another question. Can you explain the difference between focused exome and clinical exome? Yeah, so focused exome and clinical exome is the, the number, the, in this case, it's basically the number of genes which are covered. Um, so these are basically very much uh, company uh, names which you are talking about. If you're talking about focused exome, there are a few companies which are doing it. Uh, they are covering certain amount of genes which are present, which is about uh, 6,500 genes, if I'm not wrong. And the clinical exome is covering about 4,300 genes. But uh, with respect to my talk, what you are talking about, if you are asking, focus exome means we are basically doing targeted panels. Like, say, for example, muscular dystrophy panel. So, uh, or we are doing a retinitis pigmentosa so panel. So, those are focus panels, and those are called focus. And uh, you can do broader panels as well. Uh, so the broader panels would be the clinical exams, where you would basically where you are looking at uh, about a lot of things. And uh, that is it. Uh, so so uh, focus exam is basically a company term. But uh, uh, what we mean by focus exam actually is basically targeted uh, uh, panels. OK, yeah. So I think that's all for the questions and thank you for your answers. Also, many thanks to you for spending your time with ORDI today. It was a very informative lecture and I enjoyed every bit of it. So thank you again. Thank yeah, you. And yeah, I would also like to express my thanks to the viewers who joined today. We had a lot of people who joined. So thank you all for spending your time with us for today's Care for Air webinar.
And I'd also like to thank the ORDI team for their back-end support and our sponsors, Lifecell Diagnostics.